Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, it's Friday, and uh, just before the weekend, I wanted to get a, a video into you. I appreciate you allowing me to take some time off yesterday on Thanksgiving to spend time with uh, family. I hope you all got a chance to do that as well. Uh, but just for today, I'm going to do one video where I'm going to cover not only the United States, but also uh, talk a little bit about Europe and South America at the end of this video. So we're going to start off first with our month-to-date uh, total precipitation ranks by climate district. And outside of the Pacific Northwest and also parts of like the Red River Valley of the North and in northern Minnesota, much of the United States was on the drier side of things. We've been kind of keeping track of this uh, here for a while. A couple of things I want to take note about this is if we look at the soil moisture values, now this goes down to uh, 40 centimeters, about 16 inches, we can really see the very dry conditions that are setting up in parts of the high plains and southern and central plains. And there's an extension of this into southern Wisconsin as well. Um, also, in parts of the Mid-Atlantic, getting down here toward the Piedmont of North Carolina, this is a pocket in through here that's really shown up uh, drier and, and, and getting drier with time. We're going to have to watch that carefully. Maybe a good tool to monitor would be the drought monitor, which is one we certainly like to look at quite a bit. But as you look here at the latest drought monitor released just before Thanksgiving, um, one of the things I want to take note of is, um, given the recent precipitation pattern, why don't we just go look at the change maps so we can really understand how this map has been evolving, because it takes a while for the drought monitor to change, and this kind of tells that story. You know, when you look look at these colors for improvement in drought and you look at these for degradation. And so here in parts of Virginia, North and South Carolina, and then pockets right in through, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. But then look at this region in the high plains and look here. And what it's really showing us is that without that strong subtropical jet stream component, which we've talked about in the last several videos, we're going to miss out on, on really bringing in meaningful and large weather systems. Now what I wanted to do with this analysis at the beginning is I want to actually ask how well did the models perform in forecasting November because we're going to ask them to do this again for our final December forecast here in a few moments. So this is what we had. The model run on uh, the 1st of November looking at the entire month of November uh, showed up like this. And overall we would have to say the model did a pretty good job, picked up on the stronger onshore flow in the Pacific Northwest but the continuation of drier conditions through here. All right and near normal to better than normal precipitation across this region and into the Great Lakes as well. So I look at this and I come back and say, all right, how, how are we doing so far? And we've got that. And overall, I'd have to say this, is, this has been a pretty good forecast. Places that it may have busted, the northern half of California. That's one place that really kind of stands out to me. And we were drier in through this region than, than forecast. So that's just a couple of things to kind of take away from that forecast. But overall, we have to say the models picked up on the pattern quite well. Now, how about the temperature side of it? This was the temperature forecast from the 1st of November forecasting for the month of November. And we had quite a bit of cold air here. And there was some warmer air at times throughout the plains, but some cooler than average wear, uh, air excuse me, in the Pacific Northwest. And when we look back so far, I, we kind of see that, right? I mean, this would be the temperature ranks uh, by climate district. And certainly the models handled this very well. And the warmer conditions we saw at times throughout the plains, but the warmest air anchored over... Uh, the, the four corner states. So maybe a little underrepresented there, but overall we just, we have to gauge to see if the models are at least on the right track before we can trust them and then add some meteorological skill to, to kind of adjust the forecast. And overall I'd have to say the models have done a pretty, pretty darn good job with this. Okay, where's this pattern going on? What are we going to be talking about? We do have a broader ridge that's opening up here. We talked about that uh, on Monday. and We're going to see some above average temperatures, in fact, much above average temperatures over the next five days, really start to spill into much of the western half of the United States, the Canadian Prairie, and into the plains and Midwest. And the cold air is going to take its time to exit over the east. What I'm going to watch most carefully is the really deep reservoir of cold air that's sitting over Alaska. And when that cold air can get let out and start to move uh, across the Canadian prairie and then spill here into the eastern half of the United States, we need to be on the lookout for that. But to answer that, I want to do the long range stuff first, okay? And we're going to start off with just a quick discussion about what's going on with La Nina. Our Southern Oscillation Index has jumped back up to a value of about 10. Remember, it needs to be about a 7 or more to be considered La Nina. And we've got some stronger trade winds in this area that we um, need to pay attention to. We've cooled off over here in what we call Nina Region 3 and also Nina Region 1 plus 2. So this La Nina continues to strengthen. 
The wild card in all of this, uh, I think, is this colder water that still continues to sit here in the Gulf of Alaska. And if I could have made a forecast based purely upon the cold water here, I thought we'd seen the jet stream do more of this. But what it's done is it's curled up more into British Columbia, and British Columbia has been getting just absolutely hammered with strong onshore flow, and it's missed much of the Pacific Northwest. The models want to continue to bring that jet stream flow back down into California, Oregon, and Washington, and then into the mountains uh, with time. And you'll see that at the end of the forecast here with the long range, but I'm going to have to call that into question a little bit. But still, this La Nina is going, and there's a few different ways I want to talk about that. First, trade winds. Let's go up about a mile. There it is, reset. It's about a mile above our heads, and let's take a look at those trade winds. They're still quite strong in this area. And coming out of the Indian Ocean, we do have some westerly winds in this area. So just like we've been analyzing in the last few videos, this produces the best rising motion kind of in between, right? So what's coming on this side, that side, low levels of the atmosphere, it's got to rise. And our rising motion is happening here. And that sits over MJO region uh, 5 and then approaches 6, which just sits about right over there. Now, when we look at the forecast of these trade winds, remember, this is today. And we're going forward in time through the 11th of December. The bluish green colors here represent when we have time periods of, of stronger trades. And the warm colors represent where there's either slow trades or winds coming out of the west. Either way, what you do is you try to find where they meet. All right, And that's what we see. Now, in general, if I just kind of put some bounds on this, right? See that right there? OK. We're down centered somewhere over phase six. And when we look out here in the longer term forecast, we see that through the next month, the, the European model is having trouble taking this beyond phase six. It kind of tries to extend it into phase seven, but we don't see it going out high amplitude to phase seven, phase eight or one. In fact, in a month's time, the MJO, if we're, if we're not being kind of um, manipulated by those trade winds, should be able to move halfway around or even three quarters of the way around this diagram. All right, but it's not. Over the next month, it's basically going to go here. And therefore, we need to ask ourselves, if we spend time in phase five now and over to phase six, what is phase six really going to be giving us? And so I'll just show you that the correlation factors here. And this is looking back whenever we have a La Nina and we get the MGO in phase six. I just want you to see a couple of things. See where that colder air sits here in Alaska? It appears that at times it's going to get let out in this direction. And what that means is right in between where I'm kind of putting this oval, we're going to get a lot of clipper systems. And occasionally, a system could really dip down around this trough and dive through the eastern Corn Belt, dive through you know, like Tennessee Valley, and then run up the Appalachian Mountains toward the northeast. What I don't like is this. That's a pretty sizable ridge sitting over the northwest. We need to continue to return moisture to the northwest uh, to eliminate and just continue to eliminate the drought in the west. But that's the thing that I'm, I'm seeing here. Now, this, this pattern here with a lot of ridging in place, that would indicate a loss of momentum in the jet stream in the Pacific. We've kind of seen that a bit lately. See these colors right in through here? That sits between 30 and 60 north. And these would represent where we have lower zonal momentum or west to east flow. And that has dropped off from where it was back throughout the month of October, which it was much higher. And what this translates into is a jet stream that's going to have more north-south flow than west to east flow. Now take a look at this. This is part of what we call the southern annular mode, or the Antarctic Oscillation, and the westerly winds down here. Now, this is a little bit south of Australia. I mean, very fast. In fact, that's a very important factor in forecasting um, for South America, which I'll do here at the very end of this forecast video. But this is what we've got. I just went ahead and stopped this out here on December the 4th, so next Saturday. And if you notice what we've got here, we've got ridging in place here and ridging in place there. Now, that's very characteristic of that phase six of the MJO. And you see troughs coming out like this and running down here. In fact, we're going to have to watch out to see what this trough does on the East Coast. So what I'm trying to say is that at least through the first full week of December and possibly beyond, the, the teleconnection between phase six of the MJO and what's going on across North America is going to favor a larger ridge in the West. And it's been difficult to um, break this out of the models as of late, but the longer range is trying to flatten this out and get some better flow in there. And I'm not 100% sure that that's going to materialize. Let me show what I'm talking about. This is the latest update. Just got this last night from the European model. It's going to be my last forecast for the whole of December. Of course, we'll just kind of move that you know, the yardstick forward once we get into the month of December here. 
but this is what it's looking like. And a couple of comments here. The likelihood of it being above average this far south in California. I'm just going to have to call this into question because it's the model's really calling for aggressive onshore flow in very wet conditions in California. I think it'll be better for the Pacific Northwest. We will see more clipper systems running through here. So this could be a month of a lot of lake effect snow with systems then coming into the Northeast. And I know you see drier conditions here, but let me kind of just hone in on this area, pretty far to the south where I expect to see drier conditions. We will at times get systems that come out and kind of turn north just like that through much of the Corn Belt. So don't, I wouldn't look at this and think we're going to be overly dry throughout the month of December and through this area. In fact, I do expect some early season snows in that region. Uh, is the model picking up, or are the models picking up on this? Well, I'm going to show you the latest we just got here from the CFS V2. This is a long range model we run in the United States. And the week three time period, December 10th through the 16th, now you can see it. It's also pretty aggressive with the above average precipitation in the West. It's drier here, what we talked about, but that active. I don't know, mid-Mississippi or Ohio River Valley storm track is showing up. And it keeps that around for what we call week four. That would be December 17th through the 23rd. You know, the upper Midwest, the Canadian Prairie, the Western United States, and this track in through here, keeping this uh, above average. So there is some agreement here with the models. What about the long range temperature pattern? Well, I think it's got a bit of a bias to warm in this area initially, mainly because the next 10 days especially the next five days have this big ridge opening here. I think that's biasing the longer range too much. I do believe at times we will get some very cold air coming out of this. And if I just blow this out to a North American view, I just want to remind you there's a lot of cold air that's in place here that could get displaced. Now at this point, I do not see a polar vortex disruption that's going to influence, especially through at least the third week of December. I don't see anything that could do that just yet. But we're building up a pretty decent storehouse of cold air here that could get let out, and I need to pay attention to it. All right. So if you are in this area, we got the mild air coming in now, but let's just wait to see how this shifts as we go forward in the, in the, in the time period here. Okay, that's kind of my view of the long range, and that actually gets us out to the end of the year. Let's take a look at the short-term forecast. Our all-hazards weather map, there we go, is looking like this right now. We still have freeze warnings out all the way down to the Gulf Coast. There's winter weather advisories, winter storm warnings in the Northeast. We'll talk about that. Some strong winds still coming here into parts of Montana, a region that's been very, very dry uh, throughout this uh, fall time period. Well, to see where it's all going, I'd like to use our multi-model analysis again here. I got the GFS on the left and the European on the right. So there's the low that's curling up into the northeast today. This is the 12Z run, so it's about noon. And we can see that there is certainly some snow in place, some lake effect snow on the back side of this because some pretty chilly air came in. And that front you see here, that's the one that just draped across this section of the U.S. and just slowly moved throughout Thanksgiving all the way to get to here by Friday midday. As we play this forward, we're going to see a clipper sneak through Minnesota into Wisconsin. You can see it better over here in the European. This is tomorrow. So you can see some light snow here in northern Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, and then lower Michigan. Now the GFS gets really aggressive with some snow here uh, on, uh, on Saturday night. See that? But that's going to bring just another reinforcing shot at some cooler air, and you're going to walk through, work through the weekend and see some lake effect snow. Then on Sunday, we got another one. These clipper systems keep rolling through. See it right here in the GFS? It's also here. It's weak. That's what clipper systems do in the, um, in the European. And that sneaks through into Monday and then pulls on off to the Northeast. But that's really it. Other than that, through next Wednesday, the strong onshore flow into British Columbia, it does clip parts of Washington State. But that's the main target. Clipper systems roll in through here. Now, as we start the new month, this is be December 1st. Watch how things shape up here. There's another clipper. See it? Coming right down through here. The weak system on Wednesday, and then it pulls into the northeast there on the 2nd. Now, at this particular point, both the GFS and the European are setting things up for a much deeper wave to show up on Friday the 3rd. All right? It's right here in the GFS, 6 a.m. on Friday the 3rd. And it's elongated but here in the um, European. Now watch what happens here. As we play this forward, I'm just going to go right, I don't know, let's stop it at noon on Saturday. So this is Saturday, December the 4th. The European taking the wave deeper curls the low here over the Appalachian Mountains. The more shallow flow from the GFS pulls that same wave here into this part of Ontario. Either way, there's a front that slices through, okay? 
And depending on the depth of the wave, we will see snow possibly lining up on the Appalachian Mountains, getting into New England, and possibly even hitting the eastern Corn Belt, maybe this part of Kentucky, if the Europeans got this nailed. Uh, or if it's farther to the north, this is a rain event. And at this point, we're looking out here at 188-hour forecast, and the operational models are going to struggle with it. But this is what we're seeing at this point. Now, I want to look at this from another perspective in just a moment. But overall, you saw that much of the next seven days, because this is way out there on Saturday the 4th, much of the next seven days is dry. You can pick out where the storm track is. British Columbia, Clippers coming out in the northeast. Overall, aside for some, a little bit of rain here in the next few days in Texas, this is a drier pattern across a big section of the country, especially over here in California and Oregon. Now, if we look at total snowfall through the next seven days, this is what we've got. Whoa, sorry. So you got that lake effect going. Look at all the snow piling up here in British Columbia, northern Rockies. And then systems pulling into the northeast. So there's some heavier snows that are going to be there. But the European, remember, this would be Friday the 3rd. Look at what happens when we add in Saturday and Sunday. It's very aggressive with that low. Now, listen, we're just looking at this at an operational run. This is not an accurate forecast. But it has the potential, should it form the way the Europeans say it, to really go after New England. Now, remember, I guarantee it's going to change and change a lot. Because right now, the European Ensemble, this would be out there for Saturday morning, December the 4th. It's got a very large area over which that low pressure system could develop, but very large area of high pressure behind it. And what's important about this is that as that low goes through and then kicks out, there will be a blast of cold air that comes in through here. In the meantime, there won't be much cold air in place here, but after Saturday, there will be some cold air that's coming into this place. But I just want you to note that the European Ensemble has several of its low pressure uh, cells in each run kind of showing up in that same area. From there then, why don't we just look solely at week two. All right, so this would start next Friday and go forward. You can see that the model is attempting to keep above average precipitation in this area, which would indicate that that you know, system's coming through. But this was a drier trend. The longer term forecasts from the last couple of weeks have suggested this was gonna be warmer, excuse me, wetter, and now you do see that it's drier in there. And one place that kind of seems to miss out on a lot of this is going to be the southern plains over toward parts of the Mid-South here. I do see that as being drier than average. All right, let's talk about those temperatures now. Uh, we already saw these highs today on Friday. Major warm-up that happened right here in the northern plains, central plains, still the colder air over the east. Well, by Saturday, that warmer air starts to spread, and we start to kick some of that cooler air out. Getting into Sunday, though, look at this again. Just Sunday into Monday, major warmth here. Uh, for, for this point in, in the month of, of, of November as the cool air slides a bit to the east. And that's what we just see. There's Tuesday's highs and then December the 1st on Wednesday. Again, look at this warmer air that's in place in through here. That's what happens as that ridge begins to open up. Now, how long does it last? Let's go out there and look at, here we go. This would be day five through 10 uh, from uh, the GFS Ensemble. Still in place here, but that colder air starting to find a route over to the east. And what we end up getting here by day 10 through 15 is as more systems come in, we're going to be able to bring that cold air down and put it here across the Canadian prairie into the plains and then eventually over to the east. But if we do favor phase six, remember, phase six likes to put a ridge over the west. And uh, that, um, that was misforecast by most of the models going back over the last uh, couple of weeks here. So we've seen the longer term for North America. We've now covered the shorter term. I want to, what I want to finish up with is just a couple of places international. Why don't we start in Europe? We still have a December forecast that is going to be um, on the near normal to cooler than normal side for much of Europe's population center. It's only the Russian wheat belt getting into Ukraine that we're going to see these above average temperatures. On the precipitation side, I, I do like what the model's forecasting here, drier in the Iberian Peninsula but a, a rather unsettled pattern, which would, why we'd get that colder air in place, right? Uh, from, from Spain, or excuse me, from France all the way over to Poland. So that's the midsection here of Europe. And then you can also tell that uh, in this part of Ukraine coming off the Black Sea, we're gonna have some above average snowfall in this region as well. Lastly, this is a continuation of what we've been talking about for a while. In South America, the new European weeklies continue just to go dry after drier conditions here. Uh, in parts of uh, Argentina. That's consistent with the southern annular mode or the AAO, the Antarctic Oscillation being so high. Um, and the models may be overdoing it still a bit in 
Brazil's northern and eastern growing areas as well. But this really just kind of piggybacks over the long or off of the longer term discussion we've been having about uh, much of Argentina and parts of southern Brazil. All right, so enjoy the rest of your weekend. Come out with some new content on Monday afternoon and evening and share with you the latest updates. I hope you all had a good and safe Thanksgiving, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.